Hi everyone, this is Don Dixon again. Welcome back to our master class on mechanics efficient. We're in the middle of a story that occurred back in 1978 and I want to finish that, complete that, and then I want to tell you the effect that it had on me then and the effect it had me on me in my future fishing. And I'm hoping to be able to get you to a point where you're seeing and feeling and understanding everything that I felt at that time and everything that I learned from it, I hope I can describe it to you in a way that it'll make a difference for you in your fishing. So here we go. We're going out the second day and obviously we're going back to the same spot where we fished the first day. That goes without saying. Okay, so here we are, we're running up to uh, the same spot, obviously. And we got two, not one, but two flag boats following us. Obviously, they were following us because of what we did day one. Uh, so now we're really thinking, okay, we're in the driver's seat here. If we can catch one fish and release that fish, there's a chance we could win both divisions of this thing. So it didn't take very long. We weren't there but about an hour maybe. And uh, Tommy caught a fish, like 20 pounds. And it became obvious to us, there's a school of 20 pound muskie using this spot. They're using this structure. So he got this 20 pounder in, estimated 20 pounder, got it side of the boat and we called one, we didn't want to take the time to do it, but we did. We took the, called the guy with the flag, the two guys in the boat come over with the flags and they measured the length of the fish and the girth of the fish and released it, estimated the fish 20 pounds. Okay. So they leave, we're back to fishing, back and forth, back and forth, and about another hour later, we hit another fish. We hit a second fish. Same spot, doing the same thing, 800 spoon plug on wire, hitting the exact same spot to sharper break. Every fish was within a couple of boat lengths of each other. I mean, they were all at that exact spot, that sharper break that Buck refers to as a neon sign, pointing their way. And we caught that second fish, called the boat over. They stayed with us all day. And they measured that one and we released it. Both the fish were about 20 pounds. I think one they called it 19. So we had a 20 and a 19 pounder, which we released. Tournament over, we're running back in. We've got two fish released and we've got the fish from yesterday. Now all we gotta do is wonder what the other 248 people did that day. In other words, we could lose both of it we were a little bit concerned, but because the condition had not improved, I think the high for the day was maybe 48 degrees with a strong wind out of the north. It was terrible fishing weather. So we weren't really worried, but we were a little anxious to find out what they had done, what everybody else had done. So we got in there and we weighed our fish like the day before, or we didn't weigh the fish, but they announced that we had caught these two fish and released them. And they announced their weights according to the flag boats. And then we were informed about what the rest of the field had done. Once again, all these guys with all the best equipment and, and the, the reputations had not caught a fish. We had four fish and two fish a day. I mean, fishing was difficult. There was no two ways about it, but we caught all our fish at 45 feet of water. I don't think there was one other fisherman in the tournament that fished anything deeper than the weeds. So that night we had the big party uh, and they were giving away all of the prizes. And the MC, the guy who actually organized, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember that gentleman's name because he was a sweetheart of a guy. He was a good guy. And he was definitely on our team, you know. Uh, but at any rate, he was MC in this dinner thing, the after dinner and the awards ceremony and all of that. There's 400 people sitting in the room. And we had been outside uh, shooting a lot of pictures with the local newspapers and people that were following the, the, the tournament. Uh, and doing some interviews and when we came in like pretty much all of the seats were pretty much taken except for a back table There was some room at this back table. We just sat down. We had our dinner so when they Started the awards announcing all of the awards and so on and so forth They started by calling the big fish of the tournament 
so they called Tommy's name, my partner. And they talked about everything like it was a boat uh, deal, like it was Don Dixon, Tom Frenzy, but it was actually Tommy's fish. Uh, so he got the big fish, won the, the uh, I think it was a 16-foot boat he won in a 25-horse engine uh, <coughs> for the biggest fish. And then uh, they called me up to give me the award for this second biggest fish in the keep division, which was 22 pounds. And I think my, the number one reward for that was a 20 foot uh, square back canoe with a little gas engine on it. And uh, there were some other little things like depth signers and some other things that were given away as well. So they're winning all, we're winning all these prizes. So after we, he'd made this big deal about how on Friday night I'd gotten up and told him exactly how it was and what it was like and what to expect and, and gave away all of my secrets and everybody sort of ridiculed it. And he said, now, and here they are. Nobody caught a fist, guys. All of these people that were really not listening to what Don Dixon was telling them and now he and his partner stand up here collecting all the goods. They told us how it was. They said there's, that they're a deep fish. They caught these fish at 45 feet. They proved their point, and now they've won, they've won the whole thing. Then they said, oh, don't even bother going back. Uh, I think the uh, first time I, we did go back to our seats, and then they called the winners in the release division, and then they, uh, they called me up. Uh, or called Tommy up first, and then they made him stay there while I come up for the second fish in the release division, or vice versa, whatever it was. We won the whole thing. We caught everything. Every prize that they had, we we won. So we were feeling pretty good. We hadn't even told Buck anything about it yet. We wanted to see how it all was going to work out. So we knew he was going to be thrilled, but one of the things that added a little more humor to this whole story was that they had all of these prizes, and good prizes. I mean, manufacturers were donating depth signers, all kind of good stuff. And they had a lot of these prizes left over because they expected to be paying out like 20 different uh, uh, places in the keep division and 20 different places in the release division. So they said, after all of the big hullabaloo about winning the tournament and how many fish we caught and how many they didn't catch and all of that. Uh, we finally got to sit down and inside, even though we weren't showing it, we were feeling pretty doggone good. And so they explained that they were going to just do a drawing and call some numbers at random uh, and give away the rest of these prizes. So the guy brings a lady up from the audience and she picks the first ticket out she reads the number. I know this is going to be hard to believe. There's 400 people in there with tickets. The first ticket they called, I read my number. They, called, they pulled my ticket after making this big, just carrying on about how we caught all the fish. And nobody caught anything. And, and then all of a sudden, when they pulled that thing, you should have heard everybody booing. Like I said, listen, whatever the prize is, I'm not taking it. Give the next the next ticket puller, you know, give him my prize, whatever it is. I'm not taking it. Thanks a lot. And then and then they cheered. So and then on the drive home, Tom and I got to talking. And I started thinking about this section of Buck's material where he talks about depth control. And the average structure fisherman's gonna say, well. He was lucky. He, he was at 45 feet and a couple of fish stuck their head up and that's how they won the tournament. Well, it's more than being at 45 feet. That's what Buck was trying to say all along. And let me back just back up a little bit and give you my take, which we established on the drive back to North Carolina. When we hit that lake, we realized that we were in a summertime pattern. We realized when we looked at the map, we had a highland situation, a lake type. And as soon as we saw the 20-foot weed line to go along with our knowledge of a highland reservoir, we knew that we had gin clear water, which was going to be a problem. So our knowledge of 
weather and water conditions and how bright light, clear water, uh, means bright light uh, to a deeper depth and how that can affect where the fish are going to be and at what depth the fish are going to be and when the fish are going to be there, etc., etc. We knew from our knowledge of a lake type and weather and water conditions, we needed to find some better water color. We needed to go towards the headwaters of that highland reservoir. And we needed to keep going until we found some good water color. And that's exactly what we did. And then when we found that water color, we had to identify a structure because structure is a guide as to where fish are going to be. And then once we found the structure, we had to identify the depth of the brakes and the brake lines that were on and connected to that structure in order to arrive at what depth and when depth. And, and then we had to figure out how depth. Well, 45 feet. That was our target. We checked the shallows. We didn't spend but a half hour checking the shallows both days. We knew they weren't up there, and, and they weren't. And we, it didn't take us but about a half hour to get down to that 45-foot drop-off. That was our best chance. Now, that was the last depth that we could read the structure. It was breaking really sharp, but at a depth of 45 feet. Beyond that, it's just deep water. So our last real target was 45 feet. So now we've identified the lake type. We've identified the weather and water conditions. We've, we're, we, we were aware of a, a cold frontal situation, how it drives the fish even deeper. We knew we had to find some better water color to even have a chance to get a fish to a reasonable depth where he could be caught. And all of these things, when you put it together, the only thing that was left was how depth control. Well, our target was at 45 feet. And we would prefer, because of our knowledge, and we're looking for a muskie, we would prefer a trolled lure over a cast lure for the reasons I gave you earlier. So I'm thinking, how do we troll 45 feet? How do we hit this spot, the spot that we know we have to hit? And we've arrived at that spot due to the lake type, the water color, and our knowledge, and basic movements of fish, seasonal movements, and daily weather and water condition has brought us to that spot. The only thing left was how depth control. 800 spoon plug on wire line, relatively short line, 45 feet and four fish. We won the muskie tournament, both sides of the muskie tournament. And we were fishing against 250 other people. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. I'm not telling you this to say, look how great we were or we are. That's not it. It's, uh, I wanna make the point that it was a total knowledge of the things that Buck's talking about. The what depth control, the where depth control, the when depth control, the why depth control, and the how depth control. That's what he means by depth control. Where our depth control and our speed control that day, both those days, was correct. And it was a difference between, out of 250 people, difference catching. We caught four fish, they caught none, zero. But when you think about that, extreme difference. It's almost impossible to put 250 guys, whether they know anything or whether they don't, on a lake and say, none of them caught one stinking fish. That should tell you what it told me. That that was an extreme weather condition that created a, 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 a fishing condition that was almost impossible. And to the average fisherman who doesn't know, he doesn't know, who wasn't privy to all this information that you and I are talking about, weather and water, uh, lake types, structure types, the how-tos, and so on and so forth, the presentation of lures, all of the things that we're going to be continuing to talk about, to once and for all get this message across about what Buck meant when he said depth control. Depth control is a must. Without it, all of the other stuff put together will catch no fish. Like those 250 guys that had the beautiful big boats. They had boats that were just gorgeous. You know, lots of money. They had the latest and the greatest. They had all the equipment. They had all the lures and every color that was made. They had it all. But they didn't have the knowledge that sent them to 45 feet of water up in the headwaters of that reservoir. 
they didn't have the knowledge. And as Buck has said over and over and over and over in every one of his get-togethers with anybody and everybody in all his writings, knowledge is the key to fish and success. Nothing else. Knowledge is the key, but it's the total knowledge of a fish that puts you at the right depth control and the right speed control. It's what allows us to get to the fish where he is at that particular time and catch him. So with that being said, we're going to leave you for today. And the next time we get together, I'm going to tell you another example of how all of these things come together at one spot. When nobody else was catching, and we were, and why we were, and how we were, and what and when we were. All of that we're going to talk about the next time. So thanks for being with me today. And as usual, I want to remind you to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. See you the next time.